your history and your background. But before that, I've been watching the weather reports in Burgundy and um, uh, speaking to friends. And it sounds and it appears that the weather has been almost like summer for quite a long time and very dry. But can you tell us what's happening in the vineyard right now? Um, things went very, very uh, quick since the bud break. Uh, it's like an explosion of, uh, for the vines. At the moment, we are end of April and some vines of Chardonnay uh, have eight to nine leaves. Which, uh, which represents almost the top of the, um, uh, of the rose. And uh, we already, uh, we, we have made the first spraying uh, last week. Of and normally, normally uh, for the vines to attain that level of uh, maturity, when does that normally happen? So last year, that was not exactly a normal year, but a bit uh, early. Uh, I think we have between 15 and 20 days difference. Oh my. Three weeks. So at this point, we're looking at an August harvest and uh, maybe it's even- very difficult to imagine September harvest at this point. Yeah, but of course but anything can happen. Live. Yeah, okay, well. Good luck with that. I hope that uh, the weather continues to be nice and you get some water also because I think it's been very got some water. At the same time, the temperature uh, became a bit cooler since yesterday. So the grow winds will slow down a little bit, but next week we will, we are supposed to have 24, 25 degrees Celsius again. Well, the good news is you're getting very close to the end of frost that, uh, risk. Um, yes, if you consider the, the, the traditional uh, Saint de Glace, uh, we, have, we are supposed to have frost risk until May 11th, 12th, 13th. But when you are in very early year, like, like this year, uh, we can imagine we will not have any more risk uh, at this point. We hope so. Okay, well, good luck. Good, um, Tell us about you. How did you, where did it all start for you? Uh, every, everything started when I met my girlfriend at this time. <laughs> that became my wife, my wife, Aude. Uh, because before knowing her, I did not know anything about wine. And uh, I, I'm from Burgundy, but I'm from the northern part of Burgundy. I grew up in Auxerre. Uh, the Chablis fan knows uh, know Auxerre very well. This is the city close to Chablis. Uh, we drank some wine in my family, but not every, every day, and we did not really have a wine culture. So I learned almost everything uh, after meeting Aude, uh, thanks to my father-in-law. When we came to Merceau for weekend, for example, my father-in-law invited me to, to, to join the tasting he had during the weekend with customers, professional customers, private customers, to hear, to taste, and, uh, and to learn about uh, the wines from the domain. Uh, but at the same time, because to be honest with you, when you arrive in a winemaker family without knowing anything about wine, you feel a little bit like an idiot. And... Uh, my reflex was to how, how I learn about wine. And uh, I started with my wife, my girlfriend at this time, to, to start a wine program, uh, like a tasting program in Paris. And during two years, we learned about wine from uh, everywhere in the world, every different vineyard. Uh, every grapes, etc., and um, the, our teacher was uh, the former sommelier of the woods in Paris. The former sommelier from where? From the Ritz. Ah, oh, the Ritz. The Ritz Hotel in Paris. So, what was your first winemaking experience? 
So my first experience was an employee during the harvest experience. It was in 2007. And a uh, few months, three months after the harvest, uh, that's when my father-in-law uh, offered me the opportunity to join the domain. So we, uh, we made the decision in November 2007 uh, that we will move from Paris to uh, Merceau and uh, start working with, uh, with Francois. Uh, and at the same time, going back to school at Lycée Viticole de Beaune to learn about viticulture and oenology. But at the same time, because I knew uh, in 2007, after one harvest, I knew that I will not be um, able to make very important decision. So we decided to hire um, a young guy uh, just graduated from the Enologist uh, University of Dijon and uh, to become a technical manager. So we can say that from the 2008 vintage, we started to make decision to change and improve uh, the farming, uh, the winemaking, and uh, step by step, almost everything. What are the most, what, what was it like before and what are the most important changes you've made? I think the first and most important uh, improvement we, we made was the, the farming. Uh, I was very interested in organic and biodynamic farming at this time as a consumer. And I would say, uh, um, yes, as a consumer. And so I read a lot of uh, things about uh, organic farming and biodynamics. And during my um, studies at Lycée Viticole de Beaune, uh, I took all the options about this way of farming. And we joined in 2008 a group uh, of people around organic farming and, and starting the, the first experiments. And I think uh, 12 years after, because we are 12 years after, uh, it's still the biggest uh, changing we made. So you're fully orga organic now? So we are certified organic since the vintage 2018. Um, we started the first experiment in 2008. It took three years to manage all the domain and we needed to make, uh, as you probably know, new investors. We, we needed more tractors, we needed more people. So it took several years to, to manage this. And uh, after we needed more years to be confident into going to a certification process. And uh, we started the certification process in 2015. So fully certified 2018. And moreover, I didn't want to, to certify uh, the vine in Merceau because it's close from the domain and not in Cochalonaise. It made no sense for me. I wanted to do everything or nothing. And what about biodynamic? Are you experimenting and what are your yeah, thoughts yeah. on we, that? We, we started our first experiment in biodynamics in 2010. Uh, we bought our dynamizer and uh, uh, we, we still have a logistic problem about biodynamic, with biodynamic. We just use preparations in the closest plots from the domain, but it's in my plan now to develop it on every plot. Because you're happy with the results that you've seen so far? Because I'm happy with the results, uh, because uh, my team is happy with the way of uh, working and uh, um, the, the, the improvements it makes. And uh, because we see that in a long-term uh, process, uh, we see that every year we have um, new, new elements, especially in the wines. We can see some elements in the, 
vineyard that change, especially the, the, the consistency of the soil, uh, but in the wine as well. Vintage after vintage, we don't change anymore the way we vinify, and we see that uh, we still have improvement in our wine. So we can imagine the reason is uh, the, the, the farming uh, improvements. Right. So you see a difference with biodynamics in the health of the vines and the expression of the terroir in the wines. Yes, and I would say we see differences, especially in hot uh, vintages that we have more and more, uh, mm -hmm. in the acidity level. Um, we, if I compare, for example, 2009, which was my second vintage, with almost no benefits of the new farming. And if we compare 10 years after with 2019, we can see that, that in a warm vintage, we naturally have a um, much higher level of acidity, even if we have an uh, important level of alcohol. And I think yes. it's directly linked to the, the quality of farming. So I, I'm just going to take a minute. People should uh, gather questions if they have them. Uh, so when we get to a, a time when uh, we can open it up for questions, everybody's ready. But uh, Guillaume, would you talk to us about, about your holdings, about the, the vineyards that you have, uh, maybe in the Côte de Beaune, the Côte de Nuit, and tell us a little bit maybe what's new and what we should know um, for the salespeople and the buyers out there. Okay, so uh, and Ma Max has maps, so we can highlight the, the vineyards very, yeah. very easily for everyone. So, what we can say first is that because we are based in Merceau and most of our holdings are in Côte de Beaune, our identity is mostly a Côte de Beaune domain. We produce uh, about the same quantities of white and red in Côte de Beaune, and in addition to that, we do. Uh, two Premier Cru in Mercure, and we do Chambel Musigny and Claude Vougeot in Côte de Nuit. Um, if we start by the Chardonnay area, the village of Merceau, where we are based, and uh, puligny montrachet and chassagne montrachet the mm -hmm. neighbors, uh, our main cuvée in, uh, on every appellation is the vines you have behind you, Daniel, it's the Clos du Chroma. Almost 1.5 hectare. It's the biggest holding of the domain. It's the Merceau village uh, located on the northern part of Merceau in between the village and uh, Les Premiers Cru Centeno. This is one of the oldest uh, holding of the domain. This is the biggest one. This is the closest one from the domain. So uh, when I receive people at the domain, this is the plot where I like to, to bring people and to show them how we work. If we have more time, we go to Les Bouchères. But yeah, that's the, our iconic appellation, Merceau Claude du Chroma. In addition to that, we produce um, a small plot of Mechavo and Viroy de Sou. And our uh, very important Premier Cru in Merceau is Les Bouchères, that everybody at Grand Cru Selection knows very well. Yeah. Uh, Bouchères is very important for us for different reasons. This is our biggest Premier Cru in every village. This is the only Premier Cru we make in Merceau, which is our uh, village of uh, location. And um, after the Clos des Bouchères from uh, Jean-Marc Rouleau, we are the second biggest owners. How large? This is uh, 0 0.7 hectare. Okay. Uh, these pictures is... Uh, Sorry, coming back. In Les, in Les Bouchères, looking at the village of Merceau. Can you tell us... Uh, a little bit about the expression of those different terroirs between Clos du Comin. What does one expect from Clos du Comin? 
and compared to Viray, Mishavu, and Boucher. Maybe before we leave the village, we can talk about those four appellations. So if we compare the village level, uh, we can say that Roma is a style of Merceau, Meshavo, Vireuil, another one. The main difference is on this slope on the way to Volnay, we have a quite large layer of clay on surface and the limestone is uh, underground. You can't see it when you go to Le Cromain, you mostly see uh, brown to red clay on surface, which naturally gives uh, uh, quite serious structure and uh, depending on the vintage, more powerful. If you compare to Meshavo and Vira, it's quite close to Meshavo in terms of soil, you have a more sandy soil with a lot of decomposed limestone mixed with the clay. It's uh, a poorer soil that remains the water much less than Le Cromain. Uh, it, it's a soil that dries very, very quick after the rain and uh, the, exactly the opposite of Le Cromain. And as a result, during a tasting, the uh, intensity, uh, the minerality expression, I don't like this expression because it's very difficult to define what minerality means, but um, the, the intensity and the freshness uh, and the tension in uh, uh, Meshavo and uh, Vireuil is always bigger than in Chroma, which is a bit richer and even if we have precision and slight freshness in chroma, um, this is always showing uh, uh, more powerful. Okay. So it's fair to say that the chroma is going to be a broader style, a richer style, and you're going to get more freshness and precision and crispness in the Michavo and the uh, Vireuil. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Les Bouchères, uh, we could say that, like every premier cru, it's a good, uh, it's a good sum up of uh, the different era of Merceau. But uh, what defined the Bouchère for me uh, in, in my location is you got the richness and the powerful, uh, and at the same time, an intense acidity. Uh, that make this wine so complete. And this is exactly the type of Chardonnay I like. Uh, Chardonnay with uh, meat palette, with consistency in mouth, with texture. And the soil of Boucher gives a lot of texture, not to say structure, uh, to the wine. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's never um, uh, fat. It's, you, you always have in Le Boucher this uh, nice and balanced freshness that gives this Premier Cru uh, the, this, this level of, uh, of quality and expression. Okay. Should we, Brian, maybe you can ask, before we go to another village, should we see if anyone has any questions about Marceau? Any questions? Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you'd like to ask a question directly to Guillaume, you can raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand function or type the question in chat. Or you could just wave at us and we'll catch. We'll well, I, I, see, I see Lou had a question, Guillaume, about um, trellising, about how high, high the, uh, the vines, your vines grow. Um, so we like to, to, to have quite a high uh, uh, size hay of, uh, of vines to maximize the quantity of leaves, of leaves, sorry. We started to do that. It's a, sometimes the, the decision you make in Burgundy comes by chance. 
And we're starting to do that um, after the very big hailstorm of 2012 because we saw that the, 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 the impact, the destruction was less important in the vines we kept higher. So um, uh, the, the height of uh, we, we etch the vine is uh, mm -hmm. one meter and 35 centimeter. Com compared to like, what's the normal height in Burgundy? There is no normal height. <laughs> uh, you can find vines at one meter and you can find vines uh, much higher, but it's rare. Uh, when you when you are between one meter thirty centimeters and one meter fifty centimeters, you consider as high. Do you, do you think that in a in a exceptionally warm vintage there might be a, a downside to having such a large? Yes, we, we imagine that uh, you 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 manage the shadow because each row protect the next one. Uh, and in very warm vintage, vintages, we can imagine that higher rows um, is better not to have too much, too many grapes burnt by the sun. By the sun. But uh, during some hours in the day, the, the light is very vertical and anyway, it uh, burns some grapes. So can we let's let's go to another village uh, very interested in well we can stay with white wine let's talk about chassagne Manche, where you have very nice premier cru so in chassagne we only have premier cru uh, we have three different ones the biggest one is les vergers so in chassagne it's a, a bit more touchy to explain because we have Lieudis that are part of a premier cru. Mm. Our premier cru of Verger is a blend between Pétangeray and Paquel. Our oldest vine located in Pétangeray, uh, it's in a historical part called Clos saint -Mar. We are not able to label it as Clos saint -Mar because we blend it with some Paquel. That's why we show the blend as a Chassagne Premier Cru Les Vergers. Hope everybody got that. It'll be tested later. <laughs> so very close to Les Vergers because it's only a few meters away, we have Les Chenvot. It's just a little bit below and the clay, which is uh, a bit the layer of clay is a bit uh, bigger on surface. The, 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 the earth looks more red if we want to compare with uh, Pétangeray and Paquel, which is more brown. And after that, we have a very small holdings, the smallest one of the domain, which is just one ouvré. So for those who don't know, one ouvré, it's 0.0. .0 for 28 uh, hectares. Uh, it's basically one barrel in a normal year. It's in Les Rebichet, which is a part of the Clos Saint-Jean, a, a bit more in the south. And uh, in 2010, because it was the smallest cuvee of the domain, I decided to start offering the Clos Saint-Jean 100% in Magnum. That's why it's only available in uh, the magnum size. Was, was your parcel part of Clos Saint-Jean ever planted to Pinot Noir? Because I know Clos Saint-Jean is a very good terroir for Pinot Noir also. Clos Saint-Jean is one of the best terroirs uh, for Pinot Noir in chassagne mont uh, From the, the 80s, maybe the people started to uh, replant uh, more and more Chardonnay. Our plot was planted at the end of the 70s, but it, it's in Chardonnay. Okay. And um, what about the style, the comparative style of those three premier crew? 
just so we have a quick uh, uh, I would say shortcut. that Schoenwort and uh, Clos Saint Jean uh, are showing more the uh, the generous uh, and rich style of Chassagne, uh, the Paquel and even more Petangeray, which is our biggest part of uh, our Verger uh, cuvee. Uh, it's very, very uh, precise, focused, uh, and the crispy expression of Chardonnay. Okay. And because naturally it can become a bit creamy sometimes, uh, we are always very, uh, uh, try to be very precise in the date of picking in Chassac, especially in Chassac. Um, let's see, where should we go next? Pomar? How about, uh, that's a village that is, really overlooked i mean uh, it's a very famous name but um commercially it seems to be fairly unknown and uh, we'd love for you to talk to us about about pomar you have three parts how many parcels do you have in pomar so we have uh, we have six different parcels ah. we make because we have a bourgogne rouge located in pomar we mm. have three plots of pomar village which are Les Cras, Les Vigneaux, and La Chanière, that historically we blend forever in a cuvee of Pomar Vivin. And since two years now, uh, we separated a small part of Les Cras to bottle it separately as a single vineyard uh, because it's a very interesting and different identity of Pomar Village compared to Vigneaux Chanière, uh, which are located on top of the hill. Uh, in a cooler situation, and we do the Clos Blanc as a premier cru. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I love to talk about it because, of course, in the Côte de Beaune, uh, people talk about Marceau, Pinot du Marché, Chassagne du Marché, and the great Chardonnay producing appellations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, with uh, Beaune, Volnay, and Pomar, you have some terrific Pinot Noir, and um, I think it's important to to emphasize the Pomar. It's almost a, a discovery for people today. So, so what we could say about Pomar uh, in general, because we produce wine, we own vineyards in Volnay, Pomar, Beaune, and Alos Corton. Um, I would say about what I know about Côte de Beaune, I think Pomar is the village with the biggest diversity of terroir. You have the Volnay size side of Pomar, you have the Beaune side of Pomar, you have very good terroir at the bottom part of the slope on each side, you have very good terroir on the middle part and top part of the slope uh, on each side. And in addition to that, you have this combe that's cut, that cuts, so coming from the west, that cut Pomar into two parts, and you have a north face and you have a south face. So the diversity of, uh, of style, of soil, of climate, temperature, uh, and in addition to that, of selection of vines, make this village difficult to understand and uh, with a lot of, di of different style, uh, maybe farming and winemaking, that's why it's always a challenge to talk about Puma. But it's been 12 years now that Puma is probably my biggest challenge at the domain. First of all, because we produce quite a lot. It's my biggest village of production in red. And uh, so, we have to push this appellation and sometimes too much. Sorry for the GCS team. Our friend um, Ned always kidding me about Pomar. He called me Pomar is my middle name because I was always pushing about Pomar. <laughs> and um, I think since a few years now, a lot of things are moving. A lot of producers uh, are making very, very, very interesting quality in Pomar. 
And uh, I'm happy to, to see that maybe the emphasis is coming back uh, to this village again. Well, for me, should... yeah. for me, the best quality of Pomar is that it makes very high level of village wine. We talk quite often about Premier Cru in Burgundy when we don't talk about uh, Grand Cru, but village wine is the biggest surface planted. And um, uh, the, 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 this quality uh, of village is not easy to find in other villages. In Pomar, you have amazing terroir at the bottom part of the slope, like Les Cra, for example, uh, Les Perrières on the other side. Uh, these kind of terroir are full of clay. Cra means cré, it's choke. Uh, so it looks full of uh, uh, clay on surface, but the proportion of limestone is very important, especially on the ground. It's a choke limestone, which makes uh, some pomar uh, not rustic at all, very delicate. Uh, if you're able to pick ripe and safe grapes, you can make a very fresh and elegant style of pomar without doing almost anything in, uh, in winemaking. And I think this is the best quality of this village. The level of the village Lyodis is uh, very interesting and very high. That's very interesting because uh, often on the village level, you can have great value as well. Uh, sure. I'm curious also because Pomao has this image, a uh, stereotype of being rustic, powerful, a bit heavy and you know, usually when you have villages with a comb, such as this, it, it draws cool air into it. Now you have a diversity of terroir, but you also have a climate that um, could be conducive to a, a more elegant, uh, more elegant style. So do you think that this image is due to old style winemaking or just from the terroir that produces heavier wines? I think it's uh, uh, multiple factors uh, answers. It was very famous one century ago and uh, maybe when uh, appellation, but in general in life, when things are too famous, the effort uh, that uh, are necessary to maintain uh, the, this fame uh, are not needed anymore and the result is the quality decrease. I think one of the biggest problem, but it's not only in the village of Pomar, in a lot of different villages we have this problem, it's because of the fame of the appellation, we needed to produce more and more and a lot of uh, selection uh, were replanted years ago to produce more uh, instead of producing less and better. The problem is you, you understand that years after, many years after, when you make the decision of moving to another selection to produce more, you think it's a good decision and you discover 20, 30 years after that you have some degeneration that appears in the vineyard, uh, you have uh, a decrease of quality and uh, you finally uh, understand that you made uh, a bad decision and you come back and look for old massal selection of Pinot Fin and replant this kind of massal selection. That's what we do and that, that, was, uh, that is what a lot of producers are doing. Okay, does anyone have any questions at this point? Well, since we're in the neighborhood, um, Michael Nelson had a question about uh, the Bonne Lulune, en Lulune uh, terroir. Uh, Guillaume, could you talk a bit about the... Uh, sure, the yeah. So En Lulune, as you can see, is on the border with Poma. It's uh, the south limit of the Appalachian Bone. It's a conde um, above uh, the Clos des Mouches and Les Montrevenaux. 
it's a, a situation where I decided because we needed to uproot uh, the biggest part we own in Lulun in 2000, after the harvest 2011, uh, I decided to replant in white because we uh, already have uh, had uh, part of Chardonnay in Lulun and the, the identity of the white for me was much more interesting than for the red, so I decided to replant everything in white. Now it's a, bit, a big production for us, 1.2 hectares. It's very interesting to produce an entry-level Chardonnay because most of the time the entry-level Chardonnay has locate, are located at the bottom part of the slope. In clay soils, um, it produces a lot. It's a quite warm situation that makes more fruity expression of Chardonnay. Lulune is exactly the opposite, is full of limestone, very poor soil, uh, very dry soil. And as you can see, it's a very small comb at the top uh, of the hill. So in elevation, it's one of the highest points uh, of bone. And as a result, it's very cool. Not to say cold, so a, almost every year we have risk of frost, frost over there. But, uh, but I like the expression of Chardonnay with, uh, with a crispy uh, and, uh, and freshness that it makes for an entry level, uh, especially for an entry level cuvee. Great. Let's, let's talk about the north side of the Côte de Beaune, Le Scorton, du chapitre. So um, the Colline de Corton is the last move the, the Delaby uh, Geno family uh, made in the 90s. Uh, we bought uh, the Clos du Chapitre, Corton Charlemagne, and Corton Les Combes in 1995. Uh, the Clos du Chapitre is today uh, one of our very important appellation. Uh, it's the only uh, clos, 100% enclosed in the village of Allos Corton. Uh, it's split between two producers, Franck Follin Arbelet and us. Uh, it's, I can't say it's the best premier cru of Allos Corton, but it's definitely the one different from the rest of the appellation. Different for two reasons. It's the warmer situation of Allos Corton because of uh, the, the wall and uh, the enclosing inside the village. And the second reason is uh, it's the terroir with the biggest proportion of the limestone. Uh, it's funny because in our range, if we compare the Clos du Chapitre with the rest of our Pinot Noir appellation, Volnay, Pomar, Beaune, uh, and even more Côte de Nuit. The Clos du Chapitre is one of the most serious and structured wine. And if I talk with my neighbor, Franck, which is kind of specialist of the Colline de Corton, for him, the Clos du Chapitre is the uh, most elegant expression of Pinot Noir in uh, all this range. So uh, it's funny, depending on uh, with, with what you compare, uh, the terroir, how it looks like. But it's definitely a serious and well-structured uh, uh, Pinot Noir expression. This is the first appellation we introduce uh, all cluster in 2012. And uh, it's funny because if we talk about Les Combes, I always like to compare the terroir in every villages, but here it's funny because the level of classification, the level of appellation is maybe the opposite of the style of the wine. The Corton for Grand Cru shows always every year, every vintage, 
much more elegant, delicate, soft tannins compared to the Claude du Chapitre. And it's a Grand Cru. So it's a proof that when we talk about level of appellation in Burgundy, it's always more a question of soil and of, um, yes, of soil classification than of wine. And the Grand Cru can be much, uh, much more elegant than a Premier Cru. This is a, a good example. Yeah, well, we've seen that with uh, other examples of Grand Cru, such as Musigny or... Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so um, you hit on an interesting topic that's a, a bit of a, a, a hot topic, and that's whole cluster fermentation. And with the reds, so you say that you did that in 2012, with the Corton. Have you done that with Bone, Pomao, and what is your... Philosophy? So we experimented all cluster almost everywhere uh, in every appellation in, uh, in Côte de Beaune, in the two appellations of Côte de Nuit, not in Côte de um, I would say that I wanted to experiment it because I wanted to know forever the domain distant uh, all the, the reds and when you're new you always want to to experiment the opposite. And uh, people on the market were was always asking about STEM inclusion. Uh, so I wanted to try it. We started in 2012. We did a lot of experiments with a lot of different results. And uh, maybe the top uh, of the experiment was 2015 because we kept not far from 100% of all cluster in the Clos uh, appellation in 2015 with a very interesting and very good result. But the, the, the quality of the, of the experiment result was not as good in other appellation. So we went back to more destemming. And now I like to see what happened in every appellation, every vintage, and looking at the grape, tasting the grapes, we decide to add a little bit, a bit more, but we never exceed 30% now. And it's mostly done in Premier Cru and oh. Grand Cru appellations. Oh, hi, are you okay. downstairs? Okay. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> uh, okay, so. We do have a couple of, um, but I think that there are some questions, but uh, one point that uh, I'd like you to make in talking to everybody, the salespeople and everybody out here is maybe a difference in style between the 2017 and 2018 vintage uh, that, that's coming into the market. Yeah. So um, in terms of production uh, conditions, uh, we had, we had, two good vintages uh, in 17, 18. I think the main difference concerned the Chardonnay uh, because we had a much better flowering in 18. So as a result, we had bigger crop in 18 than 17. <clears throat> I think the main difference between these two vintages is uh, the the, the style. I would say the 17 is much more on the freshness side. 18 is show because if you look at the analysis, the level of acidity is about the same between 17 and 18. And in some appellation, it's higher in 18. But the perception in tasting is much more on the the, the volume and the richness in 18 and much more on the precision and the elegance on 17. I think it's not only a question of acidity, it's, uh, it's a question of balance between alcohol and uh, acidity and the flavors uh, taste riper in 18 compared to 17. Okay. 
So, but, uh, but I like to talk about these two vintages because it's two very good vintages and it's much easier than talking or comparing 12 and 13 a few years ago. Yeah. No climate accidents, no problems, beautiful crops, beautiful ripeness. It's easier. And then we have 19 also, which... Um, and then we have 19, yes. Yeah. So very exciting. Does anyone have any final questions? For Guillaume, this is a great opportunity to speak with him. Is that a no? Is that it? Should I make a... Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Long has a question. Let me... Yeah? Yeah. Brian, you want to ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I was wanting to go back a little bit to uh, your talk about organic and biodynamic farming, and I was interested in what kind of biodiversity has come about since you have uh, gone into especially the biodynamic practices around the, uh, the winery. So, um, as you imagine, it's a long-term process. So when you start converting a vineyard, depending what happened before, but we talk about our case, uh, when you start to plow the soil again and to stop herbicides, the first uh, changing you see is uh, it's not the same weeds that grow. Uh, it just gives you an information that something happened in the soil um, that allowed different weeds to grow than before. Then you start plowing the soil in summer to fight against uh, weed development. And you do it during winter, autumn and winter. And from the second years and step by step years after years, the more obvious uh, changing you can see is the consistency of the soil. It becomes, but you can see that in your garden as well. It becomes, uh, it has more aeration, it's less compact. Uh, you can see when you plow, you can see more insects and uh, bacteria, etc. You, can, you can't see the bacteria, but you see the life in general. When you plow your soil, you, in, um, if you look at it right away, you see many things happen. Different colors, kind of uh, mushrooms, mycorrhizae that develop in the soil. This is very interesting. But it means something happened naturally and there is a transformation. This transformation will help the vine roots system to uh, assimilate all the manure and organic fertilizer you bring uh, in your land. Guillaume, uh, Rocky would like to know if you have any current plans to increase your holdings to uh, acquire any new land, although it's obviously so, it's <laughs> this, is, this is not in our plan for the moment. We have a lot of work managing these 22 hectares. Um, our main goal is uh, definitely to uh, sell 100% of our production in bottle under our label on our different, on our uh, all different markets. We are now uh, on the way to achieve that. But uh, I'm not sure my goal is to increase again, but you never know. You never know what will happen in the future. You never know the opportunity you will have in, uh, in your life. Um, what is sure is for the moment, uh, I'm focused on managing my 22 hectares in a biodynamic way, uh, which is much more difficult if you increase the size. Of course. Um, uh, what is, what's different about the uh, Mercure holdings that uh, make you not include stems in the vinification process? Um, so I'm, I'm talking about my two uh, cuvées. Uh, the idea of not including stems is to keep the fresher expression of Pinot as possible 
and the softer structure. Because if you look at our range, even if the premier cru uh, are from a very good terroir and will make a very high level of Pinot Noir, uh, it stay in Cochonnes and on a market consideration, um, we need to have wines quite easy to enjoy, easy to drink, um, easy to seduce people, and that's how we uh, we make we made this Mercure uh, be famous again. And a lot of customers of Geno Boulanger and a lot of our fans started to discover our new. Uh, style through this Mercure because it's not it's not expensive so it's easy to try uh, I think it's easy to enjoy and seductive so people like it and want to try uh, a Poma or another appellation after that so that was the idea when I arrived at the domain Mercure was very rustic expression difficult to sell um, and uh, we wanted to do to see how uh, elegant and seductive a Mercure could be. I like this question from a uh, wine guy. When you started making wine in Burgundy, were there any winemakers that you looked up to or wanted to emulate? I started to make wine without knowing anything about wine, <laughs> including winemakers. Mm -hmm. The only winemaker I knew when I started in the uh, uh, in, uh, in the winery was Hubert de Monti because it was the only Burgundy winemaker that visited our club in Paris. We did a de Monti show with Hubert in 2006, if I remember well. That was the only winemaker I knew in Burgundy. So no, I learned everything, um, taking a situation and trying to improve it step by step. Um, the first people I met was through the, um, the Lycée Viticole. Because we visited the man uh, with our class and uh, starting to meet some, uh, some winemakers and to ask questions and to taste, etc. And step by step, you try to, to learn. And I really started to know uh, the other winemakers, maybe three years after uh, my, my first uh, step at Geno Boulanger, uh, when I started to travel. Okay. Um, Icy, Icy had a question about uh, Mercure. She says, some people have talked about the village not being able to make better wines because of uh, "Quote unquote lesser genetic material." So I guess she's referring to different uh, different vine stock. Is that has that been your experience, or is it the same? Do you have the same Pinot Fin vines in Mercure that you have? Uh, so other? yes, because in our case we replanted eighty percent, not to say ninety percent, of our Mercure uh, with only Pinot Fin selection we took from Massal in our vines in Côte de Beaune and in Côte de Nuit. So it's a blend of Massal coming from uh, Chambol, uh, Beaune and Poma uh, that we replanted in our plot in Mercure. Okay, so you do think it makes a difference? Oh yes, yeah. a very big difference. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Chris Miller asks, do you have any plans or thoughts on continuing to evolve the farming techniques past biodynamics, i.e. regenerative? Um, I know biodynamics is already a, a large project for you, so it's probably hard to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Having yeah, yeah. to do more work. But. Again, it's, uh, it's step by step. Now I need to, 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 to find a solution of logistic to be able to spray my dynamite uh, preparation um, in the good window, because you know after, dynami after a dynamization, you have two hours to spray it. And if you lose one hour on the road, you only have one hour to spray. So we need to find solution to spray in the vineyard, to dynamize in the vineyard, especially in Côte de Nuit and uh, in Mercure. 
um, and maybe to find a solution of spraying with a tractor. Uh, a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this will be, will be very sustainable. <laughs> spraying a, a, a dynamite preparation by a helicopter. <laughs> Oh, unless there's any other question, I think that we can, we can thank you. Uh, anything, any last question? I know a bunch of questions came in at the end and um, again, it's a rare opportunity. So if not, um, it looks like there's one more. I don't know, is that it? Uh, yeah, I see he's asking if you can talk about the possibility or non-possibility of um, no till in Burgundy's terroir. I, I assume she means uh, not plowing. No, no plowing. No plowing. Yes, it's a good question. Uh, no plowing in Burgundy is very difficult to manage because the concentration of plantation is very high. Uh, when you talk about ten thousand piece of vines per hectare. It means one piece of vine every square meter. So the concentration of vines is very big. The concentration of roots underground is very big. If you let, in addition to that, weeds growing, it will work the first year. The second year, it will be more tough. You will lose some... Uh, um, uh, vigor in your vines and as a result the size of the woods will decrease the quantity of grape will decrease and after four or five years uh, with weeds in the vineyard and no plowing uh, you will not have the possibility of making a baguette and maintaining uh, the production and the problem is this is not only a question of quantity it's a question of uh, life of the vine. In this environment, with a lot of competition with weeds, the vines um, become tired quicker and um, it's very, very difficult to keep it a long time. And a lot of examples exist uh, of um, early death in piece of vines because of too much weeds. It's much more easy, it's much easier to manage, uh, we call that enherbement, to keep and manage um, uh, weeds, grass in the vineyard when the plantation uh, concentration is less important. Like in the south of France, for example, or uh, you can find that in other, other regions, in Bordeaux, for example. Very interesting. Okay. Well, I think that's it. I think that uh, Guillaume, maybe you're getting hungry because it's, uh, it's eight, eight fifteen 15 almost in Burgundy. Um, uh, I want to thank you. I hope the next time I get to see you and all of us, it's in Burgundy in your cellar where we can travel again. And yes, sure. Out, or you come and visit us in New York and elsewhere in the United States. So I want to thank you on behalf of uh, everyone here at Grand Cru. We're really happy we were a lot. We today. don't know. We don't know when we will be able to travel again, but no. it's always a very good idea and very nice to see you, even if it's if it's through Zoom. That's fantastic. And, uh, of course, we hope that we will be able to see each other in reality soon. Yeah, I hope so. So I want to thank you and I. I just want to go back to my opening remarks a little bit because we have so many people on the phone and so on the uh, Zoom and so many people who work in the restaurant industry that uh, some of these statistics I saw today were so devastating when I saw it. out of the 26 million people out of work in New York, 40% about are connected to the restaurant industry in the United States. It's That's incredibly true. important that we all do what we can, talk to our congressmen, representatives asking for more support. So uh, I know I sound a little bit like a uh, advertisement or a public service commercial, but it's super important. 
Uh, I know I want to go out to a restaurant again, and we want people to work. We need people to work. So everybody, do what you can, do your part. Well, SafeRestaurants.com is a good place. And Guillaume, we can't wait to see you back in New York. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. We send you all our support. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.